Good evening, Clifford Baptist Church. I'm glad you're louder than myself. Something has jumped on my voice, uh, and I don't know what it is, uh, but I've got to save it for Sunday. That's what I'm trying to do, okay? So uh, I'm grateful uh, for you being here tonight. Uh, those that are here in person, those that are joining us online, I'm grateful for your presence here. Uh, I was listening to a guy today on, uh, on, on YouTube, and he said, Revival is simply falling in love with Jesus again. And so I want to just challenge you, if you have yet to do that this week, make that happen tonight. Fall in love again with Jesus tonight. Uh, psalm 19 is the psalm that God put on my heart for this revival season that I've been praying and thinking about and reading. And I want to share it with you one more time as we gather together tonight. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse number 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's go to God in prayer tonight. God, as we come before you, Lord, I know that we label this the last night of revival. But God, I pray, Lord, that your spirit will continue to move in a powerful and mighty way tonight. God, I believe, I believe decisions have been made this week that, that have been lifetime decisions. Lord, I, pr I believe changes to people's hearts and pe people's lives have happened this week. And God, I want to first say thank you for that. But God, I pray, Lord, that you pour your spirit upon us. And as Brother Earl prayed tonight, Lord, that you be the preacher tonight. As we come into your presence, Lord, I pray that in only the way that you can, you speak to every heart, you challenge every soul, and you draw each one closer to you. And Lord, if there's one here that needs to make a decision, for you as Savior, tonight I pray is that night that you come into their heart. God, we give you this moment of revival, this moment of worship, this moment of learning, this moment that we draw to your word. And we pray that you bless it now. In Jesus' name, amen.
to see you here together tonight in the house of the Lord. Let's join together as we stand and sing a song about our future in Jesus Christ. As those who are in him will one day see him face to face. When the roll is called up yonder, I know I'm going to be there. I hope you are as well. Let's sing this together now. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of our shall gather over all the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright cloud this morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, the glory of His resurrection share. And His sons and more shall gather to their home beyond the sky. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And the chorus again. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us now. Let us. says one of the last things that Jesus told us he says do not let your hearts be troubled if you believe in God believe in me in my father's house there are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go and prepare a place for you you know another thing that Jesus said as well before he departed this earth Matthew 28 we call it the great commission go into all the world and preach the gospel to every man right now I've got a special treat for you we've got Miss Lily Coots Come on down. And Carrie Hill, and they're going to sing a song right now that talks about the commission that God has given to us as believers in Jesus Christ. my feet is 
it's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith you will do greater things it's my time to go but before I phrase at the end, goodbye is not the end. When he left, it was just the beginning. One of these days, you and I are going to be joined with thousands, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of angels surrounding the throne, forever singing three words, day and night, night and day, Revelation tells us. Holy, holy, holy. Let's stand as we sing this. Oh 
Tonight we come to a very important part of our revival service, and that is the evening prayer. And, and a couple things before we do that that I want to say, and that is this. Uh, I, I look over here to my left and some special friends, Leonard and Juanita Hartless. Uh, Juanita had a bad fall down the steps at her home. And I didn't catch her last night, but last night was the first time she's been back to church in quite a while. So I'm thankful for what God has done in your life. And uh, I, want to give, I want to give her a round of applause. Good to see you. <laughs> and church family, I'm going to ask also that you pray for the Karen Coleman family. Uh, Karen uh, today, or excuse me, last night, uh, went home to be with the Lord. And so pray for her family. She has two daughters. And in the days ahead, they're going to be hard days for them. So uh, just pour out your prayers over that family, if you will. Uh, with that said, I'm going to ask Brother Sean Wells to come tonight. And Sean is going to lead us in our evening prayer as we come before God, as we seek his will for us right now, as we center our hearts and our mind on Jesus. Holy, 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 our Father in heaven, only you are holy and worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. Heavenly Father, it has been such a great privilege to gather here in this place at the feet of your anointed men of God. And Lord, we're so thankful, O oh God, for everyone who was able to come out, O oh Lord. And Father, we are most thankful now for the one who is about to break the bread of life. We lift up Brother Derek to you, O oh God. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give him a fresh anointing, O oh God, that you would use him in a mighty way, O oh God, that you would glorify your name through him, O oh Lord. We ask, O oh God, that your word may fall on fertile ground, O oh Lord. And we know that you're able to make even unfertile ground fertile. So, Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you would heal, that you would save, that you would draw all to you, O oh Lord. We lift up Brother Derek to you, Lord. We praise you and thank you. And we give you all the glory, O oh God, for the word that we're about to receive. To you be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, the Bible says in uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 18, verse 24, mm. a, man that friend, uh, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So make sure you put that in your mind. Okay? The second part of that verse says this, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm grateful that that friend to me is Jesus Christ. Amen. But I also have a friend uh, that is very close to me uh, on this side of heaven, and that is Derek Kaiser. And I'm grateful tonight to welcome him to this pulpit as he uh, gives to us uh, what God has laid on his heart. So, Brother Derek, come on here, brother. And I pray Lord, the Lord will speak through you and to us tonight. Well, good evening, Clifford Baptist Church. I will say that uh, Brother Earl and I have been in revival for two weeks now. And we have seen God move among His people. And if you're here tonight, I would encourage you to be receptive to that, to be receptive to God's moving and against God's Holy Spirit, to, to pay attention to what the Spirit is speaking to you tonight. We've seen God do some powerful things in the past two weeks. I've had the privilege and the honor of preaching at several revival meetings, and I'm excited to be here in my home church. I'm excited to be here amongst the people that ordain and confirm my calling and send me from this place. I, I'm glad to be home, if you will. It's good to be here with you tonight. Uh, as I was studying and preparing, I have been praying all day. Matter of fact, I, I just decided to take off today and spend all day in my study praying and preparing for tonight because as, as some have said here tonight, this is not the end of revival. We don't close down revival. We don't stop revival. This is the beginning of revival. You see, as God speaks to us and as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we go from this place revived and ready to take what God has done with us, His, His Word and His, His, His good news, we take that out of here and go out into the world. So I hope to give you a piece of that encouragement tonight from God's Word. 
If you have your Bibles with you, let's go to 2 Peter, chapter number 3, verse 18. 2 Peter, chapter number 3, verse 18. I can hear Jim Hooker already. Thank goodness he's only got one verse. (laughs) And the Bible says this. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, we thank you once again for this opportunity to gather together as your people in the house of God. God, your spirit is here. Your spirit is moving. And Lord, I can already feel it through song and worship, Father. Lord, I thank you for those that have brought us to this table now as we open up the bread of life. But God, I I can't do this. Lord, I'm a sinful man. I've messed up. I've fallen short even today, Father. So, oh God, I'm asking that you forgive me. Forgive me of my sins and forgive me of my trespasses, Father. And, And Lord, just move me out of the way. God, just move me out of the way and use me as a vessel to deliver a message tonight and what you have for your people and what you have for me. God, I'm here to do one thing, and that's to exalt your son, Jesus. And I'm going to do that because this is not about me. Oh, God, it's greater is he and little is me. I'm so thankful for this opportunity, Father, to be invited to come here. Lord, I just thank the people that have helped me to get to this moment, get to, to this place invitation of a pastor in the church. I'm just so thankful for that. And God, I ask now that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, because you are my strength and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we open up our text tonight, uh, it's a familiar text. A familiar letter. Many of us have studied First and Second Peter. We know that Peter is writing several letters to the church. Uh, now, around the first century, we know that a uh, fire had broke out in Rome, and this fire destroyed many of the buildings there in Rome. And many suspected that the emperor at that time, Nero, had ordered the city to be burned so that he could rebuild it. But Nero then turned the blame to the social outcast. <laughs> of that time, the Christians. He blamed them for the fires. Once they began to get the blame, they began to get harassment and persecution. And this harassment and persecution then caused them to to flee Rome and go from there and be scattered into the providences of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. So Peter takes some time to, to write several letters to these that are scattered. If you would just thumb over just a few pages to 1 Peter, we see that who he's addressing to. 1 Peter, chapter number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout. Now this word strangers here means that they're sojourners. They're, They're just passing through. And then that word there, scattered, means that, that they're dispersed, diaspora, as he writes to those especially the Jews who have migrated and were literally scattered throughout the Roman Empire in Asia Minor. And so that's who he's writing this letter to. And here in his his first letter, Peter takes some time to to write to these scattered church. And and he's encouraging, he's telling them not to lose hope. He's telling them not to become bitter at what's going on with the persecution around them. He encourages them to trust the Lord And then he encourages them to look to that blessed hope, to that second coming. And so, as he finishes up his letter here, now at the letter that we're in, 2 Peter, it's some three years later that he writes to them again. Peter most likely is in prison as he pens this letter. He's facing death. But he's come increasingly concerned about false teachers in the church. So he writes the second letter to expose and defeat false teaching within the church. He wants to encourage those to be grounded in Scripture, and and not only to be grounded in Scripture, but to understand it, to dig into Scripture. 
And again, he reminds them to look at that grand and glorious day, the second coming of our Savior. Friends, we too have been scattered, have we not? We faced a worldwide pandemic, scattered the church for some time, and and now many of us are just trying to get back together. We're trying to get back to whatever normal means in life these days. We're trying to adjust to that differences, and, and then we're facing persecution of our own because of we, the church. There's social unrest in the world, and political unrest, and So many crazy things going on in our world right now. I think this letter applies to us even today. We're in perilous times, friend. I don't think you have to go very far outside these doors to see that we're in perilous times. The church faces those that will not endure sound doctrine. And many are following after their own lusts. Many are heaping up to themselves teachers, false teachers. Many just have itching ears and only come to hear what they want to. And because of this, many have turned away their ears from the truth and turned under fables. Because they're listening to false teaching. And so Peter is writing this letter to to encourage us And to revive us. Church, we need to be revived. We need revival within our churches. And so here as we get to chapter number 3 of this letter, uh, Peter is beginning to, to write to stir the church up in revival. He's reminding them to keep their focus on that day of the coming of the Lord. As you you scroll through and and, and read through the the verses here in chapter number 3, he's talking about that, about the coming of the Lord, and for them to keep focused on that. And then we arrive at our text. We get down to Peter's benediction. His final words to his readers. And look at what he says there in verse number 17. He says, Yea, therefore, beloved... Uh, This word in this sentence, it's emphatic. He's saying, you, beloved. This word beloved is is the word that means dear and close. He he loves these people. He's saying, you that I love, just as Christ loved the church. Peter is also writing to those that he loves. And friends, tonight, I come with that same heart, that same attitude. This is my home church. This is my sending church. I'm speaking to you tonight to stir you up, to bring you back to God's Word. He he closes this with a a strong reminder in verse 17 as he gets down to his benediction. He's saying, be on guard. Don't give in to false teaching and the the ways of this wicked old world. He reminds his flock to to stand firm, which is the main purpose of his writings in these letters. Especially to those that are spread out, dispersed. But in this benediction, in, in his closing, we see how we're to do that. He gives us instructions on how we're to to ward off the false teaching and how we're to stand firm. He begins there in verse number 18. He says, but. Now, many of you have heard my preaching before. I like the buts of the Bible. And here's one of them. He, he's saying all these things in his word. This is a conjunction as it's used in its sentence. He's, he's saying on the other hand. So all the things that he's said in this letter, he, he brings it down to this final ending. And he says, but. But on the other hand, the most important thing he's getting ready to say is for us to grow. But grow. Peter realizes that this dispersed church that that has been separated from, from the main church and they've been scattered about, he realizes that if they attempt to stand still, they will have a far greater tendency to fall than if they were moving forward. So he tells them to grow. He makes an appeal to them to to grow. Listen to what Paul says. Just just listen to these words as he writes in Galatians chapter number 5, verse 16. Just listen to these words. Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to another, so that ye cannot do things that ye would. As Paul writes here, he says, This I say then, walk. Uh, This word here, it's a verb that indicates continuous action. It means going somewhere. We think about that in our daily lives. If, If we're walking somewhere, we're going somewhere. We're getting somewhere. And that's what Peter's talking about here when he says to grow. We're we're to be growing in our faith. We're to be growing in areas of our lives. However, the lust of the flesh causes us to stand still sometimes. To be embarrassed. To not stand up for the things that we need to stand up for. to, To not go after the things that we need to go after. And so here, Peter encourages us to grow. Some of you here tonight are not growing. Some of you here tonight are just sitting there. Same places you've always come. You're just coming to church, just doing the same old thing. You're just coming in and sitting down in your place and tapping the preacher on the way out. Good message. And by the end of the day, you don't even know what the text was that he preached from. Some of you are not even opening up your Bible, not even reading your Bible, not even studying your Bible on a a daily basis. Some of you are not even praying on a daily basis and speaking to God the Father and asking for His guidance and direction. You're not growing in your prayer life. You're not growing in your study life. Some of you are just sitting there. Peter is warning us that if we don't grow, that's what causes us to fall. We go from setting to falling. So he encourages us in two areas where we need to grow in. Let's look at those. Verse number 18 says, But grow in grace. Grace. Grace is the gift from God that we get that we do not deserve. Grace is is God's favor towards us through His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, we deserve our consequences. When we sin, those things come with consequences, and we deserve that, for the wages of sin is death. See, we deserve to be on that old rugged cross, friend. That is our punishment and our penalty for for not following God, for rejecting Him. But God loves us so much that He gave us some grace in His Son, Jesus Christ, that He he sent His Son to die for us, to, to take our sin, to take our punishment. That's grace. We need to grow in that grace. Oh, and while we were yet sinners, but God commendeth His love towards us that in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That's grace. While you were rejecting Him, while you were turning your back from Him, while you were telling God that you didn't need Him, He still sent His Son because He had grace for you, because He loved you. He went to that old rugged cross and he died in your place. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, but by grace of God, I am what I am. It is by God's grace that he makes me who I am. Now let's just look at how Peter talks to me. He ends his letter just as he began this letter, uh, 2 Peter. Just flip over a page there to, to chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And, and Peter is encouraging us to grow in our grace. 2 Peter chapter number 1 verse 2. Peter begins his letter talking about God's grace. Look, look here, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Grace be multiplied You see, some of us have experienced grace. We've accepted Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, and and we've understood His grace. We've seen His grace, but we've become stale. We forgot about His grace. 
We haven't been growing in His grace. The Bible tells us in Lamentations, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Friends, some of us need to go back to that day when we were saved and and we received God's grace and His mercy. And we need to be growing in that. Now, there's a second area now that Peter encourages us, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Knowledge is uh, simply understood as coming to know or growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Uh, keep your finger there and just go back to 2 Peter 1. He, uh, Peter again describes these things of knowledge, areas that we need to be growing in. Areas that we need to be challenging ourselves in. Look look there at verse number 5 in in chapter number 1. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Virtue, which this means moral goodness. And virtue to knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. I thought Christy was going to amen right there. And to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some of us here that need to make this list, that these are some of the areas that we need to be improving in, that we need to be adding to our lives. Moral goodness and knowledge and and temperance and patience and godliness, brotherly kindness and love. Friend, I'm asking you tonight, are you growing in these areas? Or are you just coming in this church house and living your life day by day setting? Peter's encouraging us to grow in these areas. And and as we grow in these areas, this even includes growing in our knowledge of the Lord, our our knowledge through the Bible, through His Word. And this is how we defend ourselves against false teaching. This is how we defend our homes and our families, by growing in these areas. Are you doing that? Are you studying God's Word? Are you digging into God's Word and, and listening to God's Word and praying God's Word? And asking God to reveal Himself through His Word? Or do you have a dusty old Bible that you just bring to church once a week? We need to be growing in our knowledge. Peter also says that we're to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To grow in the the good news of Jesus because that is the central theme of the Bible that that Jesus came to die for us. We need to understand that He's our Savior, that God sent Him to to save us from our sins. And we need to understand that and grow in that and understand that Jesus came and He lived a perfect life on this this earth and he, He died for you and for me. And He went to that old rugged cross, not because He had to, but He chose to. We need to grow in that knowledge that that Jesus didn't die and stay dead in a grave. No, friends, He he rose again. We need to understand that and grow and and, and study that and know what it means when He rose again to to sit beside the Father and pray for me and for you. And that one day He's coming back. One day He's coming back to get us. We, We need to grow in that knowledge and study that and understand that He's coming back to get His church. He's coming back to get us, to take us home. We need to be growing in that knowledge and understanding what Jesus did for us. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. We need to grow in that knowledge. Peter finishes up his letter. To him... Be glory, both now and forever. Interesting doxology is Peter points to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything is all about Jesus. You, you know, I think about this in its context. Uh, some, some years after, after the ascension of Christ, and, and Peter himself had, had preached at Pentecost, 
And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Peter built the church as Christ promised that he would. And Peter went on and he preached that great Pentecostal sermon where thousands were saved and the church exploded from there. Peter himself was a powerful evangelist and he marched right up on the steps of the temple. You remember that? Right after Pentecost, I, I, I just like to picture this, and I, I know it's not right, I just like to picture this, that, that he smacked old John on the back and he says, hand me my Bible, we're, we're going preaching. And, and so they go right to the temple, and, and they get to the temple, and as they're walking up to the temple, there, there's a man laying there, and he heals that man. Let, let's look at what happens here. If you will, just turn over to Acts quickly. Acts chapter number 3, beginning in verse 10. This man had asked for money and, and asked for healing, and, and Peter heals this man. And look what the Bible says as Luke records it here in Acts chapter number 3, verse 10. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed, held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that was called Solomon, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man walk? the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified His Son, Jesus. Here's a, he just healed a man, but yet he points to Jesus. This great evangelist, this great man of God that's being used points to Jesus. It's not about him. It's about Jesus. John 3.30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Peter's own life demonstrates what he writes in verse number 18. His own life demonstrates what he had done, growing in grace and in knowledge. Peter had been restored by Jesus, and, and Peter, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, established the church, and, and, and he demonstrated his growth and knowledge by giving all the credit to God. But where did Peter grow from? Where did Peter's growth in, in both grace and knowledge, where did it start from as we study these letters? Well, we know that Peter, or, or Simon Barjona is his Jewish name, they were a native of a small town. Bethsaida. Peter and his brother Andrew, they were sons of Jonas, and his family were Jewish fishermen. But see, it was Andrew that grew Peter. Uh, Andrew grew Peter from a, from a fisherman to a follower. Because of Andrew, Peter grew in grace. Andrew took Peter to Jesus. Andrew had went down to the Jordan Valley to, to hear John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was preaching his great message of repentance and the coming of Christ. And, and it was there that, that Andrew heard those words, Behold the Lamb! Andrew was looking for this Savior, and, and once he would found Him, he was excited about this, the discovery of, uh, of the Christ. And so he hurried home to get Peter his brother. Let's read these words in John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1, beginning in verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and, and, and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They saith unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? 
He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. And it was about the tenth hour. Now listen here, friend. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now look, look what he does here. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. That's where Peter grew in grace. Later, Peter would would answer that call to, to follow Jesus. He would surrender his life in grace and follow Jesus. That's where Peter began to grow in grace. Peter would then go on to grow in the knowledge of his Lord. Jesus called a few men as disciples and as apostles. Men who could, who could bear witness to his life and, and carry out his work long after Jesus had returned to the Father. He molded these followers and he molded Peter and he, and he taught Peter in his knowledge to be an evangelist for him, to, to spread the good news. Peter had become one of the first disciples, a, a close disciple. As we look at through Scripture, he was always listed first when the disciples were listed. Peter then went on to be a leader of the apostles as he grew in knowledge after Jesus' death. As we've already said, he preached that that powerful Pentecostal sermon. Peter then became the greatest soul winner in the early church. Thousands come to know Jesus. Paul refers to him in Galatians as the, the pillar of the Jerusalem church. Think about how Andrew felt on that day of Pentecost. Some three years later, as Andrew sat there, and he watched his brother stand up and start preaching, and he started to see souls surrender to Jesus and and repent. Do you think about how Andrew felt? Little did he know that this man that he brought to Jesus would change the world. Andrew, his name being translated, means manliness. He was a manly man, a a hardy fisherman. But yet he humbled himself to the second seat of his brother's ministry. Who was closest disciples to Jesus? Peter, James, and John, not Andrew. Whole sermons are recorded in, in, in our Bible about Peter and, and, and things that he said and he did. Only a few words of Andrew are spoken. Because it's all about Jesus. To him be the glory. Now and forever. I have an Andrew. I have an Andrew that's here tonight. My father. My dad was seeking a Savior. My dad found that Savior. My dad was saved. And then he led his family to Jesus. I have an Andrew. And when I was 12 years old, I was at a revival meeting in Natural Bridge, Virginia. And because my dad brought me to Jesus, I was there in that church that night. A youth pastor had taken us to an old revival meeting. And because I had an Andrew, because my dad brought me to Jesus, I was there that night. And it was in that moment as a 12-year-old boy, August 14th, 1994, I grew in grace. I heard the gospel and I responded. I remember just before getting home that night, the youth pastor pulled that van over and I prayed the prayer of salvation. I grew in grace in that moment because I had an Andrew, someone that brought me to the feet of Jesus. And that following Sunday, I remember walking down the aisle, Chip Pendleton was preaching Psalm 51, repentance of sin, and I walked down the aisle and publicly announced that I had given my life to Jesus. The hymn, Whiter Than Snow, was playing. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat, I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. 
By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Because I had an Andrew. Because my dad brought me to Jesus. I grew as a 12-year-old boy. I, I grew in my knowledge. I, I continued to, to seek the Lord and study His Word. I, I, I grew and and that grace then grew in knowledge. And that knowledge landed me here to this place, to this, this church. And, and I've grown so much in my knowledge here that this church has called me to be a deacon. This church has called me to be a Sunday school teacher and a Sunday school director and many other places. I grew in my knowledge, but I also had men here that helped me. Pastor Mike. And then Brother Earl took me under his wing and, and he taught me and Brought me up in my knowledge. I also had, a, had an encourager, Jeffrey. A man to surround me and grow me in my knowledge. And little did anybody know, little did my dad know that as a 12-year-old boy, as a, as a man leading his family to the cross, that years later his son would be preaching a revival service. Friends, I have prayed all day today that you would bring somebody to this altar tonight and pray for them that they would be saved. What is a soul worth? That person that you may bring or that you may invite or that you may cry over tonight on these steps. That person may be the next Billy Graham, the next preacher, the next... Who knows what that person could be? All because Andrew went home and got his brother and brought him to Jesus. Who will you bring to Jesus tonight? Who will you bring to these steps tonight and, and weep over that they would be saved? Growing in grace and growing in knowledge teaches us that, that every time we mess up, every time we're outside of God's will, we're sinning against God. We're separated from God. Our sins separate us from His glory and His presence and His plan for our lives. And the wages of sin, the Bible tells us, every time we do something, it's building up this account. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But maybe there's some Andrews here tonight. Maybe there's some Andrews here that that want to grow someone in their grace and grow someone in their knowledge, that they want to go get that person. Or maybe you're here tonight and you need to grow in grace. The Bible says that all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart by faith that Jesus died on a cross for you. And the Bible says you will be saved. Maybe there's some of you here tonight that need to grow in grace. And maybe there's some of you here tonight too that need to grow in knowledge. That you've been sitting on these old pews a little bit too long. And you need to grow. You need to get up and not only stand for Jesus, but move and walk a little bit in your relationship with Him. I encourage you to come here tonight and ask the Lord to help you in those areas. That you'll fall down on your knees and say, Lord, I need to grow in these areas. Because if not, the world's going to attack you. And we've seen that through the preaching of His Word tonight. You're going to fall if you're not growing. So maybe there's some here tonight that just need to come to this old altar and say, Lord, I, I want to grow. I want to get back on the path. I want you to lead me and guide me in those areas that I need to grow. I encourage you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I think there's some of you here tonight, I, I, I just feel it, that the, the Lord is telling me there's some here tonight that need to grow in grace. That there's an Andrew here tonight that brought you here. Maybe it's a friend or a relative that, that brought you here. And you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Friend, in just a few moments, our pastors are going to be up front. I'm going to ask them to come on up. You come. Don't, don't. This is between you and the Lord. If you need to grow in grace tonight, I'm pleading with you, friend, you come. You come be obedient to the calling of the Holy Spirit.
Just say a little prayer like this. These are not my words. These are your words to God from your heart. Just, just say something like this. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I need to grow in your grace, God. And I believe that Jesus went to the cross and he died for me. I, I believe that by faith. And I confess with my mouth that you are Lord Jesus. And Jesus died for me. And I believe that in my heart. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Oh, friend, if you prayed that prayer tonight, please come. Come to these pastors. They want to help you and disciple you. If you're not sure about your salvation, if you were to die today and you don't know where you would go, you need to grow in your grace tonight. Oh, friend, let's get that right tonight. Come to these pastors. Maybe there's some here that need to grow in their knowledge. Need to get back on that path. Need to stop sitting in these pews. Need to, to stand up and walk and grow closer to God. Please come to these altars. But here's the real invitation for us, church. Maybe there's some Andrews in here. Maybe there's some Andrews that that need to bring some people to the feet of Jesus. Once you heard the gospel, it said that Andrew went and got his brother immediately and brought him to Jesus. Oh, my prayer is that tears will fall to these altar steps tonight over the lost, our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, our co-workers, our friends, our family. I pray that you're obedient to the Spirit and we'll, we'll weep over the lost tonight. And then we'll go get them and bring them to Jesus. Stand with me. Father, would you seal these things in our heart that we may not sin against you. In Jesus' name. Tonight, our hymn of invitation is just a simple declaration. I have decided to follow Jesus. If you need to make him your Savior, personal Lord, tonight is the night when you come forward as we sing. If you need to do other business with God, you come on. If you want to pray with our pastors, they're here. They're ready to, to meet you as you come. Again, the altar is open. As God leads, you respond. I... As we conclude our worship service today, we want to say thank you for watching and joining us as we worship Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's always a joy to gather together as the family of God and lift up His name. We are thankful that in today's time, we can do that all around the world. So whether you're watching near or far, we count it a joy that you're part of the family of Clifford Baptist Church. If you are a believer, we pray that today's message encourages and strengthens your walk with the Lord. Today, if you need Christ as your Savior, we pray through the Holy Spirit's leading that He will draw you to Himself and that you will make a decision today to follow Christ as your Savior. Please feel free to reach out with those decisions to Clifford Baptist at cliffordbaptist.org. We appreciate that email that you will send to tell us of your journey of how Christ has impacted your life. Praise be to God.